but to those who much is given, much is expected. When you are the leader, the corporate executive or the superintendent has to utilize what you have as far as your talents, expand on them if you can, but always keep them sharp. Welcome to the CEO Sessions, hosted by Ben Fanning. And here's Ben. Today's interview is with my father, Dr. Paul Fanning, who's been in education for 46 years, ranging from 1969 all the way to 2015. He was school superintendent for 27 of those years. And in case you're not totally sure what the superintendent actually is, the school superintendent is essentially the CEO of the school system. Now, over these years, he saw to the education of over 125,000 students in Alabama, Georgia, and Kentucky. He led school systems successfully through big changes such as desegregation, proration, Title IX, education for the handicapped, migrant and homeless education, recession, student nutrition, changes in sex education, and technology. Additionally, he led a school system out from under state management, and during this time, the school system had schools in the bottom 25% of the state, and under his leadership, they rose to be recognized as national blue ribbon schools. His education is as follows. He received his doctorate from the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. He received his master's from Sanford University in Birmingham, Alabama, and his bachelor's at Athens College in Athens, Alabama. He also received awards for the, being the outstanding superintendent from the University of Montevallo. He was the Alabama District 4 nominee for Alabama Superintendent of the Year, and also he received the Service Recognition Award by the Alabama State Senate. Now, in today's podcast, you'll discover the importance of learning to grow where you are and how to do it, what to do if you don't have a supportive cast to help you get to the C-suite, why waking up at 5 a.m. every day can fuel your success to the C-suite, and we spent a lot of time on that, but also we'll talk about the surprising cost of waking up every morning at 5 a.m., the essential exercise of establishing a daily and weekly routine for yourself and your team. And then there's a pretty entertaining story in here. The time where John Maxwell landed his plane on top of a strip mine to speak to dad's team. And then we wrap this up with something you probably are not too familiar with, but the art of frog gigging and how it applies to lifelong learning. All right. Hey, Dad. Thanks, and welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Ben. Looking <laughs> forward to it. Yeah. Glad to have you on today. Thanks for being a willing willing participant. So uh, let's just go ahead and dive right in. Okay. First, first question here. Knowing that you grew up in a small town, in Madison County, Alabama, did you ever think that you'd ever become superintendent when you were back in those days? Not initially and not when I started my career in education. I just, I just wanted to do a good job where I was. And when I got out of service, uh, I still had a good bit of a GI, well, I had a GI Bill to help with any, you know, future career options I wanted to pursue, you know, that required, uh, some more more education and knowledge, and uh, so fortunate I had that. But uh, when I started, the possibility grew in my mind as I advanced in the educational leadership positions. And I uh, started, I did a lot of different things in addition to teaching. And the first two leadership positions I had, I, I, I used the term I was sort of drafted, asked if I was interested, and I said yes. Uh, me to deal with them and parents uh, at that time uh, your mother and I were not uh, uh, were not dating and so uh, it was a, just it was just a good time for me to explore some options if, uh, if they were going to be there but again first thing I want to do a good job where I was and you know you gotta you gotta grow where you are and uh, I try to keep that uh, perspective in mind as I you know as I moved on and uh, you know, had these other opportunities and they were available and, 
Uh, I was fortunate, had a lot of good folks to work for and with, and uh, that uh, helped broaden my perspective even more. Well, say, say, okay, so say someone wants to be in the corner office and get, get to the C-suite or get to the superintendent, you know, leader level there. Say they, they don't have, you know, people around them. Like you mentioned, you had a supportive cast around you, mentors, leaders uh, that were supportive of you. What would you recommend to those people if they don't have those kinds of folks in their life? yet they still want to get to the C-suite? Uh, be good and work hard in what you do. Uh, in your position, like, uh, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, you know, you've got to grow where you are. Grow and where you are, yeah. If you, if you do that uh, and you help people and include those that you work with, those that you work for, sometimes that uh, volunteer effort helps out. And, uh, Believe me, in public education, there's always something to be done and uh, assistance to be rendered. So I think that's one thing is be good, try to be good in what you're doing. Uh, be open uh, to considering opportunities that might, might require more time, more work, but at the same time, afford you the opportunity to show what you can do. And if and you also find out if you enjoy it or not. Uh, uh, I, I was I was fortunate there. So again, I I, I think I, I grew where I was, and uh, uh, but at the same time, I I tried to avail myself of opportunities because I wanted to be I wanted to explore more. Uh, I felt like you know there there's a lot more to uh, uh, enjoy and view in this career, and so I continued with it and. Uh, Again, the first two times, uh, first two positions I had when I sort of, uh, used term advanced, it was uh, mm-hmm. uh, it was a matter of uh, you know sort of being drafted. And, hey, Paul, do you interested? And uh, yes, I was. And so I, I went on. I was single, and so I I did not have uh, uh, those family type responsibilities that eventually I, I certainly enjoyed when when they came. When, came my time to be a husband and uh, to be a father and eventually become a granddaddy too. But uh, anyway, it was uh, it, so, it, a lot so, of different factors. So, so Dad, it really sounds like you had people that identified your potential early on. Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, I've, I've been in that role before. And uh, one okay. thing – I can appreciate is is an individual's curiosity about what you do, about what they do. So uh, again, and what do you I, and how do you approach someone that you see has a lot of capability or potential, but they don't see it in themselves? Uh, well, one way is just to directly ask them. One another way is just to observe. And uh, sometimes provide them opportunities with, say, I, I use the term smaller projects uh, mm-hmm. that might be uh, affiliated directly with a leadership position and uh, ask them to assist. Committee work is a great way. Uh, sometimes it's just helping doing the, you'd be amazed. Sometimes I did all the requirements, uh, or I use the term requirements, all the things that. Uh, you have to be involved with sometimes even from, uh, you know, resealing the gym floor. Uh, <laughs> when it's, it's your call. When you, when That'll you show you some there, potential. <laughs> and, there's, uh, and there's no <laughs> one there, uh, no so, one else there to do it. So anyway. So you, know. so you help them realize it by giving them some challenging work or like you say, a committee, a chance to lead in a smaller way to let them discover yeah. it within themselves. Is that it? Yes, uh, leadership oftentimes is, is not allowed activity. Uh, or wait, wait, say that again. Leadership is what? It's not necessarily a loud activity. Allow, okay, it's or leadership is not allowed activity. It, it is, well, well, sometimes it has to be. Uh, or it so, can be, okay, so it can be but, quiet uh, or not. So uh, you just have to. You just have to get in there and, and do the work and uh, let your actions uh, do the talking. All right. All right. Very, very good point there. Um, 
looking back at your career now, say like you're in your 20s and 30s and you're starting to see, hey, you know, I, I've people have invested in me a little bit. Um, they're kind of pulling me up into some of these leadership positions. I know you were a principal early on, assistant principal, principal, assistant superintendent, and then superintendent over multiple school systems. What What's some advice that you would give the the younger Paul Fanning, say in those 20s and 30s, that you think could have accelerated your professional growth? So in other words, help you get a lot further in your career. What are you, you talking about? You know. What? Well, I start out, if you're talking about, uh, you know, about, I guess, uh, practices that I had, uh, my dad, uh, your granddaddy always got up early and, and I got up with him because I wanted to be around him. So All right. my, my internal clock from, you know, from five years on, uh, kept on ticking early in the morning. And what time are we talking? Pardon? What time are we talking that y'all would wake up? Uh, my dad would normally get up probably about uh, five o'clock. Uh, right. So okay, you know, I, I would hear him, and uh, uh, so I'd, I'd get up too. And uh, so my first bedroom that I remember was on a porch that had been converted into a bedroom, and it was right next to my parents' uh, bedroom. So it was easy to hear to hear him get up and hear the. Uh, hear the hogs outside too, but uh, anyway, <laughs> just, just getting up early. Uh, proved, All right, so that was instilled in you at a young age. Uh, yes, yes, but again, I got I got up early primarily out of curiosity, as I recall, and then it just, it just kept on and okay. So it, uh, but when I I kept I say kept the habit or whatever whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it. Uh, I found out that those early morning hours provide me an opportunity to work undisturbed, usually mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the, what could the usual ordinary paperwork uh, without interruption. And then by doing that, then I had time during the what you would call the normal duty day of a mine expedition, uh, you know, to uh, spend on time with interaction with you know with staff and students and schools and community professional organizations. Another thing I found out too, that I really mm -hmm. never thought about until it really started occurring when I was in some sort of the advanced positions. I also found there are a lot of early, a, a lot of other early risers affiliated mm -hmm. with education and business and industry they had the same habit and some mm -hmm. of the strongest relationships that I was fortunate to have resulted in basically maintain from those early morning meetings and phone calls. And so uh, it really benefited me. Uh, but during the day when I felt like I needed to have more flexibility and uh, tried to develop some openness with the people I worked for and with, that uh, I had uh, had flexibility to get out there and be with them. I wasn't tied up in an office and uh, yeah. or a desk, and so that uh, it really benefited me in that. So you would way. use your so, Dad. You would you would put your. It sounds like administrative paperwork. That's what you would address first. Uh, in the morning, is yeah, that right? Yeah, yes, yes. I, I will. I would come in. I would check the uh, check my calendar for the day. Uh, but there's always uh, the business end of education or the corporate world that mm -hmm. you have to deal with with assignment purchase orders, uh, personnel matters, things of that nature. Now, some of those may not necessarily be able to do be done during the normal, uh, during the morning, or you have to do it during the day, and then that's, that's, that's okay too. So that's what helped me uh, have flexibility during the day to main, especially. Uh, being a CEO or here in the corporate office, uh, is a lot about relationships hmm. and, uh, that's a lot of leadership too, but, uh, you got to have those relationships, those interactions and, uh, okay. that, that, that early morning routine served me well. It may not serve others. Some people may say, well, I've got to have, you know, eight hours sleep and that's fine. <laughs> I'm at the age now where I get a lot of that. I'm making up for a time at my lazy boy. Well, what was your 
typical hour? How many hours of sleep were you getting during that time period where you're consuming? Uh, well, during the week, uh, anywhere from maybe four to six hours. Wow. And I, could, and I, I, and I could work on that, but uh, I mean, I, I mean, I could just do, but again, that was a habit. My, my metabolism was set sometimes not very high, but, uh, Okay, so you're able to function on that minimal yes. hours of sleep. Yes, and I was also, uh, uh, you know, I drank a lot of coffee too, but that just because I just like coffee. Okay, so, all right. That, that caffeine probably probably kicked in at times too. Did, did the 5 a.m. roll call, did it have any downsides uh, that you can identify? Uh, yes, because, uh, and you know this personally, that uh, – uh, there wasn't time in that time in the morning where you and your sister and your mother were up to where I could eat breakfast. And I did on the weekends, but, uh, you know, we had those pancakes and waffles on the weekend, but, you know, <laughs> being able to have those uh, early, earlier morning times with, uh, uh, with family, I think that's one thing that, uh, uh I did not intentionally miss, but I felt like it was important to do what I was doing and to have that flexible time. I mean, that, that came with the territory and some of those things, you know, you, you know, you give up, but, uh, uh, to me, it didn't impact me as much then at that age and in my career as I, as I think about it now. Okay. Were you, were you eating breakfast at the time or did you skip breakfast? Uh, usually skip it. Skip it, okay. It would, be, it would be very light, and again, I just, you know, I really liked coffee. And uh, it took, took years before your mother was able to break me into half and half. <laughs> but, okay. But I, I, drink, I still drink it now, but uh, I, just, I just liked it. Did uh, you, you mentioned the weekends, too. What time were you getting up on the weekends during that period? Oh, I might sleep another 30 minutes or an hour. Okay, just a little bit. But you uh, were now, believe me, I could get, I, I would get up at five o'clock easy to go, to go, uh, on a fishing trip or something like that. But, uh, you know, going, being outside, those are sort of activities that I, I sort of nearly gave up uh, for several years. Uh, but, uh, anyway, you know, I, I could, I could still get up early on the weekends. They always had uh, church on uh, Sunday morning. And, uh, those were, those were, uh, any, per, any other per, success per, routines, dad, any, any other routines or rituals that you had at the time other than early, the early yeah, rise? Yes. Uh, being, yes. Uh, routine being, I, I set schedules for myself and I told the principals and the board and my board members that I work with, um, as to like, going out and visit schools. Mm-hmm. And uh, being and being in the community, you had uh, had a I thought that uh, being involved uh, with civic organizations. I've been a member of Kiwanis and uh, Rotary clubs uh, for a long time in my career. It's very beneficial to me. Uh, just trying to be involved with the uh, being involved with the community and and helping people. That that was what I was in was trying to help people and. Uh, that occurred in other arenas other than just in the schoolhouse. And okay. so, uh, but, I, but I felt like uh, on certain days of the week, depending on the size of the school system, principals and oftentimes teachers knew they could expect me in their school sometime during that day. And also when it was being on the, being going and uh, reviewing a bus route with the principal, the director of transportation, Going and visiting lunch rooms. Oh, I love that lunch room. We had some great cooks mm-hmm. in public schools, and uh-huh. I, felt, I showed it frequently. But uh, it was uh, being able to go out and have those scheduled and unscheduled visits. But that becomes a part of routine. But they knew certain days of the week okay. I was going to be in their school, and then at other times would be unannounced, depending on what the situation was. So, so the key in that is. For people to consider having a routine, not just for yourself, but also establish it with your team, with your team, so they know what to expect, and they yes. can count on. I mean, I, and I, I encourage them to. Of course, they, they a lot of times they had to, they had to deal with what I farmed out to them, 
uh, which might restrict them. But, right, or uh, sometimes help them set the routine. Maybe maybe they're not used to it, and so a leader can help yeah, them establish they, they, that. There are times I say, you just go. Uh, I've been in a situation yeah. going to visit a school, or sometimes a classroom, lunchroom, the school bus route, that I saw something that I had uh, a question and sometimes a significant question about. And, uh, you know, and I wanted to go back at a different time and, and, and see it again, uh, again, a different time of the day. Uh, so uh, sometimes differences or different settings when you are present may give you a broader or a different view. Uh, one time, and I, I, I don't hate to admit I'm proud that I did it. One time, I, I terminated uh, a bus driver mm-hmm. uh, for what I thought was uh, inappropriate operation of the bus. Now, when I had him come in to talk with me about the matter, and he was, I used the term, he was swearing up and down. He said, Dr. Fanning, I, I did not, I did not exceed the speed limit. I, I almost swear, you know, I, he was, he was serious about it. I said, well, you know, he feels that strongly about it. And he's pretty well known as a, you know, as a mild mannered, pretty good bus driver. And I said, well, i tell you what, let's just hold this conversation for now. Mm-hmm. And uh, he offered, he said, he said, what we did, we had a system on the bus, had cameras on the bus. And it also not only recorded the behavior and good conduct always of students, uh, it also recorded uh, the miles per hour the bus was traveling. Yeah. And, and, well, anyway, bottom line was after I got involved with it, I found out that the uh, bus uh, bus speed was less than what it was synchronized for. Uh-huh. And so I had to go back and lick the baby again on that one. But uh, uh, my mind was made up. I said, you know, if I have to make a decision, I'm going to release the, the, the bus driver. But I'm glad I didn't. And I called him back in. I told him he was right. So it seems like a, like a success trait there is – to listen to your listen to your gut or listen to your intuition, and then do another review if you need to. Yes, I mean that's uh, that, that, there's nothing wrong with correcting a, a mistake. Yeah, uh, and I, I learned that from your granddaddy, uh, Fanning. And uh, but anyway, I thought the I mean I learned a hard lesson there too. But the one who took it the hardest was not me, was not the bus driver, not the transportation director. But it was the mechanic who installed the system on that bus. He was just nearly heartbroken, wow. and uh, <laughs> wound up I wound up having to give him more comfort than I did the bus driver. And I did not expect that because uh, the mechanic, the band, had great mechanics, and I took great care of the buses. And but that one, it, it, it happened, and he explained to me how it probably happened. He went back and. And uh, I know the transportation director said whenever he got uh, to working with those systems again, he was very particular about it. And I, and I can understand that too, because he was sensitive to it. But uh, anyway, he was the one to say, uh, had to, had to provide him some support too, because he thought, you know, somebody else was suffering because of his error. And, uh, you know, I told him, I said, believe me, I made plenty of mistakes. I've had plenty of experience in trying to wake up for them too and wasn't always successful in that. But, uh, yeah, no, that's a great illustration of that. Let me, but, uh, but he was, uh, yeah. you know, they, they were both great guy, but I'm glad I went back. You glad and, you went back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's important. Whether I, you're, I, I think there's nothing wrong with correcting a mistake. Yeah. And, uh, if, if you, if you're provide that opportunity and I had that opportunity and I did, and I, I was a better person for it. Did that, how did that learning lead to growth and success for yourself down the road? Uh, other situations that may be, may be questionable or sound so out of the ordinary that you need to get validation for yourself by yourself or else you need to call others in. There's a, uh, as I, as I say advanced in, uh, in my career, 
uh, I had opportunities to form and work with a lot of committees because sometimes they just had a they had a broader and more knowledgeable perspective than what I had. And I thought I always had a good one. I didn't lack for confidence there, yeah. but the depth and breadth of what they what they had to offer uh, was pretty significant. And so uh, I, I think a use of uh, effective use of committees. One of the okay. things you can do to hurt yourself, uh, excuse me, credibility wise, is try to have a paper stamp committee. You know, if I'm if I were going to, if I was going to ask somebody to come and work in the committee, and it takes time, because a lot of times it was done after the normal and usual duty hours, because they all had other responsibilities, and, and especially people in the community who would leave their business to come meet with the committee. Well. You know, you have to give credence to what their good intentions are. Or well, same or not, you might have one that didn't have good intentions, but uh, to me, very seldom. And so, uh, you know, if I didn't agree with them, I would tell them. But, you know, at the same time, I had to honor their work. Yeah, that, that, makes, that, that, that makes sense. Not, every, not everybody agrees with that. And uh, some people say, well, you know, you give them to uh, stamp your work verify what you've done. I, I said on review committees to review actions of others. I so it's really, you're going to go through the trouble to create an advisory committee, make sure they actually are empowered to do their own research and present their information yes, in a biased yeah, way. Yeah. And and try, to provide, try to provide them every reasonable resource you can if they're going to make a recommendation. Yes. And, uh, but the football for them, that's part of the decision making process. They think they are making a decision because they make a recommendation to the superintendent or to the board of mm-hmm. education. Uh, they they need to have their work. On. You may not agree, you or you may agree, but to honor their, their work and effort in what they do. And so I, I think that's, I think that's a important part of being the being the leader, or whether you're a superintendent or whether you're a Fortune 500 CEO. Let me let me shift gears just a little bit because I know you probably had a lot of situations where you had employees that had ideas, big ideas for change, for innovation, an opportunity to make an, an investment. <laughs> What's your advice to those people on how they should communicate it to the to the C suite? Uh number one, I use the policy and the process. And if there's not a policy or process uh, available, then my responsibility as superintendent or someone's responsibility as CEO is build one that works. If it doesn't work, then I think you use a key communicator. What in the formal or informal relationships, the communication process that, uh, you know, that occurs sometimes, uh, I've I've had people, not fortunately, not many times, but I've had a person to call me from what a hundred miles away and say, "Did you know this about so and so?" I said, "No, I did not." He said, "Well, you might want might want to take a look at that." And uh, so, uh, sometime that came from a very that was an external affiliation that had existed for years. I did not know it. Wasn't any big deal to me except out of curiosity, but one, use the policy and the process. And if if you're not, if it's the one's not available, uh, you need to recommend that uh, one, one be, be constructed. Okay. If you've got an employee, so they, so use the, use the process or, or the policy. So make sure so the employee needs to make sure that they follow those guidelines because you got them there for a reason to present their idea. And if they don't have one, um, and they're, I guess they need to piece one together themselves. Is there any, is there any, what strategies do you think they could use to make it more palatable to you? To look at <laughs> and then to consider it. Uh, more palatable to the CEO. Right, to consider it. So say you've got okay. someone in your office or a teacher that's got this idea and they're just calling you or emailing you. Uh, what's What would make it more interesting for you to look at or to interrupt your day and take a look at it? 
Uh, I'd like to know what the options are. The page said, well, Dr. Fanning, what if you could set up a budget committee, <coughs> excuse me, uh, made up of uh, teachers, principals, board staff, bus drivers, lunchroom workers, uh, custodians to consider, uh, you know, the cost of a such and such a, uh, item and possibly, you know, save money and improve efficiency. You know, to me, what's important to me, how will it help us do our job better? And that is educate school children, educate school children. Okay. We had so, to have so tie it back to the broader mission. If you've got an idea. Yeah. And yeah. you tie it back to the bigger mission of the organization. Yeah. Is that it? I've had, I've had people to come to me and said, uh, and, and they would have a spokesman who would talk to the devil, you know, if need be. And I guess <laughs> some of them felt like it was, I was, I was fit that role, but huh. you know, they, they had people in their groups who, uh, who, who cherished that opportunity. And I can remember a lot of them very well. Uh, and a lot of the majority turned out to be great people, great workers, and had something to contribute. Some of them would say, well, you know, you've got this process in line that would help custodians do this, this, and will tell me about it. Well, believe mm -hmm. me, they jump on with both feet. And uh, so, well, well, maybe we need to have some more discussion on this. Why don't you uh, bring me some more bring pros and cons? Now, if you're going to tell me something's good about it, Tell me what the downsides are so we'll know this going okay. in that we can deal with that. So uh, the the brains of an organization also exist outside the CEO's uh, in, in a lot of different ways who can contribute a lot quickly if they're organized and given the opportunity and they're and they're willing to willing to work, especially if somebody's going to say, help themselves and their colleagues by learning how to uh, put down gym sailor, you know, in an afternoon rather than taking all weekend. <laughs> so it's just uh, all right. kind of thing like that. There's, uh, you know, uh, and again, I talk about, uh, you know, honoring what those people do and how, what they have to say and working committees. And uh, that's, uh, that's the time, you know, at least give them the chance to have a say or assign it to someone say they need to follow up on this report back to me at the end of the month one thing or another but well, what do you say to point. those i mean what do you say to those people that say oh my goodness they they want me to form a committee on this and they just roll their eyes because they're like and all we need is another committee well if if the committee's work again is honored and they know that committee work in the past has uh, evolved into solutions for issues uh -huh. or uh -huh. problems. If they see the evidence, they've got to see evidence or know of evidence. Uh, I had somebody mention to me one time as, as a, a superintendent, I guess what my, my second superintendent is, we heard you did this, this, this. In the previous system, you worked well. I had no clue they knew that, mm -hmm. but Work they did, around. and and they <laughs> and they were pretty correct. I missed a few details, but uh, that's okay too. But uh, uh, and the question was, could we consider some of the yeah, you know, as long as we know that 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 the answers are yes, no, maybe, or what can we do better to make it happen? Uh, so so it know, sounds so like you're saying you really need some evidence. Like you're saying, you need evidence and you can point at past committees that did it right. They got a result that was positive, made an impact. And that sets the tone for all future ones. It's almost I like think, setting a positive precedent or something. I, I think, I think, uh, that, that helps in a lot of the times that, that present themselves. I mean, not always. Uh, some people look at committees as just doing old dog grunt work, in their opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it just but no, you you got to you just got to honor what they do with reason, explanation, your results, one way or another. But tell them, got to be honest with them as you, okay. you can be. But, All right, uh, let's. Say, that's honor that's good stuff there. 
on the committees and the options. So policy process options, pros and cons, you know, really showing that they've thought through this. Um, okay. Now uh, let's shift again here. If you had somebody, dad, who reported to you, who was obviously burned out and you could just sense that they're going to, that they could possibly quit. How would you approach them? Uh, the times that has uh, come down my path, uh, I would uh, usually, the great majority of the time, I'd be very direct. I'd find an opportunity to meet with them, not necessarily in the superintendent's office either, sometime out in the parking lot. Uh, you know, sometimes they're just they're sometimes different places, but there are times that it happened in the superintendent's office. But I'd be very direct and say, you know, I'm noting there's some difference in your behavior. And if there's a concern that you have, uh, then I'm more than glad to discuss it and try with you and try to help you if I can. There are times when, uh, I couldn't help them. What the help they needed was external to the school system. Mm -hmm. But I was able to say because of relationships in the community is get them help in a very low key way that they want to keep personal. And that was fine. And, uh, it, uh, it would stay with, stay with me and them. But, uh, anyway, just, uh, uh, I would, I would be direct, but sometimes it'd take me a while. Uh, before I, find, I have to well, say mull it over some, and, but uh, I would bring them in, uh, you know, note what I perceive to be different behavior on their part, but tell them, you know, hey, I'm here to help you if you can. And if I can help you, maybe I can find someone to help you. But uh, uh, sometimes it, it, it can be a variety of reasons. And uh, some of them even surprise me, but you can't back off of it. And uh, if you say, well, you know, there's nothing we can do in the school system, but I know someone you can talk to. But uh, and what's uh, an example say, hey, of a way you would kick off a direct, a direct question to them? If you, yeah, uh, yeah, I would. I just have to. I'd say, uh, you know, you're acting a lot differently than what okay. you want to. Okay. And it sounds like you said in the parking lot. Does that mean you would look for uh, timing? Uh, a cat for a casual conversation. That's right. You know, meet them in the parking lot. We're coming and going different directions, and uh, and say, "Hey, uh, can you got a minute?" And uh, uh, sometimes you have to open it up with uh, some just some general conversation. But then again, I didn't. I did not. Uh, I've I've gone around the mulberry bush several times to get to a topic with a person that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it wasted time and uh, their time, my time. And uh, I think it maybe diminished the relationship initially. But once we, once we got into what their situation was and discuss it with them and help them explore options or whether I could help them as superintendent, whether I could help them just as an education colleague or find a resource in the community to help them. I felt like that was my responsibility to do that if any way I could. And then, uh, and then try to follow up either by observation or again, just direct question. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Or I noticed, say hey, that, uh, uh, you told a very interesting story the other day that normally they may not tell, but a ch their, their change, a positive change in their behavior, uh, sometime is a uh, hard, hard to dismiss if you notice the negative behavior to start with. Okay. Very, very helpful to hear that. Is there a, where would you know to draw the line between, you know, you're, 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 you're having direct questioning, they're sharing, yes, I'm feeling burned out or I'm thinking about quitting. How far down the road would you go before things start getting maybe too personal or, I mean, I'd say, I, I would say, tell me, when this gets to a point of real discomfort with you. Ah, uh, okay. You know, they want to talk about it. They get to a point, suppose it is a family matter that's causing this, quote, burnout, in quote, if you will. 
uh, which, which, which that happens. And, uh, and some people just don't want to talk about it because it is just so personal. But if you're the CEO, you have a responsibility not only to them, but to the greater, greater corporate spirit, if you will, uh, to have uh, an effective and efficient functioning organization that produces whatever your uh, mission and goals are. Mm -hmm. So th these people, if they're, if they're strong enough that you bring them into the organization, you know, hopefully they're strong enough for you to retain them and it benefits them. It benefits okay. the organization and it may benefit others, maybe their family. So, uh, Got it. I've been, uh, I, I, sometimes that's some of the feel good moments you experience when you see that sort of thing. And was I successful all the time? No, I was not. Uh, and I thought about, boy, I could have done that. Well, I could have done that better. I need to shorten my trips around the mulberry bush to get to the topic because all I did was aggravate him or her. And, uh, so, but anyway, you know, it, but the thing about it is, if you don't know how to do it, then learn ways to do it. And sometimes you can read about it, you know, now with uh, uh, technology, you know, you can, I use Google as my favorite source at times. Uh, uh, you know, the, go and just throw the topic out there. And uh, some of the things I did not know how to do, I found out how to, how to do, you know, through Google, YouTube. Sometimes YouTube pops up on the, uh, you know, on, in, in Google. But you also have to be a lifelong learner. Whether oh, I like it's that. Corporate, whether it's a corporate dimension, personal dimension. Uh, you know, to this day, when I was a kid, about gigging frogs, okay, going frog gigging. And uh, somebody would laugh, laugh about that, but there was an article in Field and Stream several months ago about two guys who live in the northern part of New York State who were pretty good frog giggers. Well, I enjoyed that article immensely. And they talked about the ways they – they were, they were hunt, uh -huh. hunting frogs and, and also marketing frogs. How they would sell so, you know, so you th So the listeners may not know about frog gigging. Can you give us like the one-minute description of frog gigging? Uh, nighttime, have flashlight, watch out for snakes, have a good gig and a good boat, and sometimes hip waders. And a gig is like a little spear, right, or a knife? Yes, almost okay. like a trident. Got it, okay. I'm so you some go, up. Go. These guys, one of them was evidently a master of knocking out the frogs with a welded together boat paddle trident, whatever. And anyway, it was, I, I, I chuckled when I read it, but I remembered when. Mm. Uh, but I, let mm. it be more specific, but you know, have something you enjoy along with the professional arena too. Uh, well, it's filled the stream. I, I, well, you know how I like to work the word search puzzles. Find the word in the, in the maze of letters. Uh, I've read a lot of broad range of uh, literature material, material, especially probably the last 10, 15 years of my career. I read a lot of John Maxwell. Uh, and uh, he, had, he had a lot to offer. And we, in fact, we had him come to Kentucky uh, one time. And he and he, he, he flew in, and uh, you have to realize, well, you know about East Kentucky somewhat, about how high the hills are, and that's one town they flew into. <laughs> it had been a coal, coal uh, revenue town, and they landed on nearly the top of a strip mine. But they prepared as an airport. So, anyway, wow. Uh, we, we enjoyed all. He did a great job, and uh, we gave him, when he left, we gave him a dulcimer. Uh, mm -hmm. and he, he said about the only musical list he'd been given except what his parents gave him, but uh, because that's you know, from it, the region, that's this, from yeah, Eastern Kentucky. A, a lot, of, a lot, a lot of enjoyment with uh, uh, and try to keep a broad perspective. So, 
of so what, what other what sources of inspiration i mean I, I know john maxwell like you told that story and you're instrumental in bringing him in to that area um were there any other sources of inspiration that you found throughout your career that got you through some tough times? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I've read what, what three, I get well, two or three publications on Colin Powell. And Colin Powell. Uh, okay. I really, I really enjoy, I mean, there, there are a lot of folks who have written a lot of books. And, uh, hmm. you know, but I, I enjoyed uh, reading those. Another one that I've read, I know th- at least three books on, was about the uh, federal judge, Frank Johnston. Yes, I've heard you I talk about him a lot. Probably, he was probably one of my heroes, along with uh, your grandparents on both sides of the family, your father and your mother. Uh, but anyway, just uh, I found those very, uh, very good for me. Was there a certain challenging time that that you remember that one of those or multiple of those got you through? Uh, well, both bo- bo- both of those, uh, Powell and Johnson, uh, the way they wrote and what they wrote uh, gave me pause to reflect and think and plan ahead during some tough and challenging times, especially in public education where you have uh, constant issues with <clears throat> new policies and especially trying to utilize financial policy. And when the economy goes sour and, uh, you know, you've got to prorate your budget and uh, you realize you, the law says that ten, only 10% of your budget uh, can be used to absorb 90% of the cut. So it sharpens your planning too, and that, and that helped me, help me get a broader perspective on policy too, the use mm-hmm. of policy. Uh, so those those are things that I, I immediately recall. And Dad, just to clarify, is it you say Colin Powell or a different Powell? Uh, the general. General Colin Powell. Okay, Colin Powell. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Great. No, very helpful there. Uh, one of the things. Uh, and we've just got another minute or two here, but a lot, a lot of the listener, the listeners like to understand, or, you know, what, what's a tool or a gadget that has contributed to, to your success? Because sometimes that can be fun to go out and, and check out and maybe get for themselves or something like well, that. Is there anything that comes to mind for you? It's probably no, nothing, anything unique. Uh, but I'll, I'll, let me start off with this a tool that is uh, has a variety of applications for career and, and personal needs. But decades ago, even way before you were born, I started out with a, a bag phone. Not many people knows what they are. A bag uh, phone, a major, yes. Yes, about no other. A two-way radio. Two-way radio. Uh, some of those came along after, after you, you and your sister were born. And, uh, but anyway, the bag phone, the pager and two way radio, uh, really help with effective communication. Yes. And, then, and then finally I moved into the cell phone era <laughs> uh-huh. and uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> but you, you need to have applications that are applicable to what you need. And it's not only professional, it needs to be personal too. Uh, because, you know, a, a cell phone just becomes almost like a billfold, if you will. Uh, I also learned after I got the cell phone uh, use, I found out the value, the value of a good service provider and having good battery capacity. That's the reason I ask you a lot of how much battery capacity you don't on your cell phone. Yes, yes. Uh, but uh, I've, had them, I've had them go down on me. Uh, but probably my, my failure to uh, charge them, but dependable communication devices that's yeah, got a variety of variety of apps uh, that meet your career. Per- personally, I've got an app on my phone now. That's a compass. Okay, are you using and that? I, I, and that? I, I deliberately, I deliberately got that because I mean I use the GPS and things of that nature. But I figure 
you know, it's, it, that's a good tool to have. I mean, I don't use it very often, but uh, when you start getting my age, you <laughs> maybe lose your place. You maybe lose your place in the environment. Yeah. You got you have to redirect. Uh, uh, yeah. But but you know, hey, is the sun shining in the east or coming up? But anyway, yeah, you know, a good, dependable communication device has got usable apps. And I got some that I could probably whack off. But were, I were there any quotes? It's kind of got me thinking. Were there any quotes that you hung up in your office? Or anything yes, the uh, uh, one was and it made reference to uh, Frank Johnson, and uh, he was generally quoting uh, Abraham Lincoln, and the quote was something. Though don't hold me to verbatim quote, but uh, you'll get the general idea. You probably okay. heard it before. I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. Okay. What is and, it? You, know, you, you can probably look it up and uh, get two or three different versions about what, about, about what the quote was. I aim to do the best I can for as long I can, as long as I can. And if in the end time proves me wrong, then what 12 angels swearing wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> uh, wow. So anyway, but I've always been, you, do, you do as best you can or as long as you can. And to me, if I were to advise Abraham Lincoln right now, which is not going to happen, uh, yeah. I'd say for as many as you can. And I think he did that. Right. But anyway, Judge Johnson did that. And one thing I admired about him, and I told you one time, he was probably one of my heroes, uh, is that he did what needed to be done in a state that that had the had the brains but didn't have the guts to do what was right mm. and a uh, people and that state uh, being Alabama and he, just, and he just uh and 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 he did it I mean in a lot of different areas where people had need and uh, I was fortunate in my career to be able to experience what he sought out to do and did do. Not that everybody liked it, certainly not. Uh, but anyway, he did it. And uh, he was a native uh, of the state of Alabama. And uh, he, uh, in other words, I, I think to, to more of us than would admit it, he did us proud, if you'd excuse the colloquialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, me, I was very proud of what he did. Not necessarily all the time, uh, every day, but as I got older and I had more experience, and I think my vision while I wore glasses was certainly broader professionally, uh, I, I saw I saw what he did and he'd be doing, and he uh, he had the guts and the brains and the backup to to get it done. And uh, but yeah, that was that one quote uh, by Abraham Lincoln. I kept that. I got out of the Birmingham Post Herald, I laminated it and put it in a frame and hung it in my office. It gave it for years until the frame came apart and I accidentally tore up the article. Uh, but wow. anyway, that, that's one thing. You know, if you're looking for a scriptural reference there, all sorts. Uh, I remember one that a, a chairman of the Board of Education told me, said uh, came from Acts. So one of your granddaddy fan didn't tell me about it, but maybe he did. I conveniently forgot. But uh, to those who much is given, much is expected. And uh, when you're the when you are the when you are the leader, the corporate executive, or the superintendent, uh, you have to utilize what you have as far as your talents. Expand on them if you can, but always keep them sharp. Yeah, that's that's excellent. I think that's a great place to to wrap up right there. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm, I've enjoyed. It. I, I hope hopefully it's beneficial to somebody. Uh, <laughs> I have I, I had a I lot of great be. I had a lot of great mentors, <laughs> and uh, some I've told you about. Some you knew personally. Uh, your first babysitting, first family ever babysit you or the Grizzlies in Montgomery, Alabama, from Montgomery, but they were in Tuscaloosa where we were in school together and working. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. he was uh, he was a great mentor, called on him many times. He never failed to 
uh, to respond. And that's the reason why I feel the same way about uh, the people I've worked with and try to help them out. Great, Dad. Thanks for sharing today. Great job. Right. And maybe, right. maybe, for, maybe for a joke gift, you can uh, find yourself a bag phone and give it to, give it to <laughs> Archie. For All right. Will do. All right. Thanks, Dad. I love you. Right. Love you too, son. Bye. Ben Fanning is a number one best-selling author, Inc. Magazine columnist, and CEO of the Fanning Group, an international consultancy and corporate training company. To learn how they can help your organization, go to benfanning.com.